Don Bosco's prophecy about the future of his Salesians in South America, part three. If you haven't seen the other parts of the dream yet, just click on the playlist at the top of the screen. This is the episode where we reveal how Don Bosco saw things in South America that hadn't even been charted yet on the maps. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I've seen enough, I replied. Now take me to see my Salesians in Patagonia. We turned back to the station and reboarded the train to return. After traveling a very long distance, the train stopped before a town of considerable size, possibly on the 47th parallel, where at the very beginning of the dream, I had seen the big knot in the rope. There was no one at the station to meet me. I got off the train and immediately found the Salesians. I saw many houses with many people in them, more churches, schools, various hospices for children and youths, artisans and fanners, and a school for girls which taught a variety of domestic arts. Our missionaries were caring for both the young and the adults. I walked into their midst. They were many, but I didn't recognize them, and none of my old sons were among them. All were looking at me in bewilderment, as though I were new to them, and I asked them, Don't you know me? Don't you know Don Bosco? Oh, Don Bosco, they replied. We know him by reputation, but we have only seen him in photographs. Do we know him personally? Certainly not. And Father Fanano, I asked. Father Costamagna, where are they? We do not know them, they responded. They're the ones who came here long ago in the past, the first Salesians to come to these lands from Europe. But so many years have gone by since they died. I gasped in wonder at their reply. But is this a dream or reality? I clapped my hands. I felt my arms. I shook myself. And I really heard the sound of my clapping. And I could feel my body. And I kept telling myself I wasn't asleep. This visit was but the matter of an instant. Having witnessed the marvelous progress of the Catholic Church, of our congregation, I thanked Divine Providence for graciously using me as an instrument of His divine glory and the salvation of so many souls. Young Cole, my guide, meanwhile signaled me that it was time to go back. So we said goodbye to my Salesians and returned to the station, where the train was ready to depart. We boarded, the whistle blew, and away we headed northward. The region of Patagonia closest to the Strait of Magellan, between the Andes and the Atlantic, isn't as wide as geographers claim it to be. The train rushed along at breakneck speed, and I thought we were crossing the provinces of the Republic of Argentina, which already had been civilized. Our journey took us through a virgin forest, interminably broad and interminably long. At a certain point, the train stopped and our gaze fell upon a very sorry sight indeed. A huge crowd of savages was gathered in a forest clearing. Their faces were deformed and dirty, their bodies covered with what seemed to be animal skins sewed together. They surrounded a man who was bound and seated on a rock. He was very obese, having been deliberately fattened by the natives. The poor fellow had been taken prisoner and from the sharpness of his features seemed to belong to a different race. Hordes of savages were interrogating him, and he was telling them of the adventures he had encountered in his travels. Suddenly one of the natives arose, brandishing a shaft of iron which was well sharpened, though not a sword, and he threw himself upon the prisoner and with one blow cut off his head. All the train passengers crowded at the doors and windows, gazing upon the scene in horror. Cole himself was looking in silence. The victim uttered a shrill scream as he was struck. Those cannibals then threw themselves upon the body, bathed in a lake of blood, and, slicing it up, threw chunks of warm and still quivering flesh upon nearby fires, let them roast a while, and then ate them half-cooked. At that poor man's scream, the train began to move and gradually resumed its breakneck speed. For hours at a stretch, it skirted the shores of a huge river. At times it was on the right bank, at times on the left. 
I couldn't tell through the window what bridges we used to make those frequent crossings. Meanwhile, along the banks here and there, we spotted numerous tribes of savages. Each time we saw them, young Kole kept saying, this is the Silesian harvest. This is the Silesian harvest. We then entered a region packed with wild animals and poisonous snakes of bizarre and horrifying shapes. They swarmed over the mountainsides and hill slopes. They blanketed the hilltops, the lake shores, the river banks, the plains, the cliffs. Some looked like dogs with wings and were extraordinarily bloated, which symbolized gluttony, impurity, and pride. Others were gigantic toads eating frogs. We could see certain lairs full of animals different in shape from ours. All three species of animals were mixed together and snarled dully as though about to devour each other. We could also see tigers, hyenas, lions, but they weren't the same as those of Asia and Africa. My companion then spoke to me, pointing out those animals to me, and exclaimed, The Silesians will tame them. The train was now approaching its starting point, and we weren't far from it. Young Kale then drew out a map of astounding beauty and told me, Would you like to see the journey you've just made, the regions we've traversed? Yes, of course, I answered. He then explained the map on which all South America was detailed with marvelous exactness. More than that, it showed all that had been, what then was, and what would be in those regions but without confusion, rather with such a clarity that one could instantly see all at one glance. I immediately understood everything, but due to the onrush of so many things, that clarity lasted but one hour, and now my mind is just one big jumble. While I was looking at that map and waiting for the youth to offer some explanation, I was overwhelmed by the astounding things I was looking at. I thought I heard our Quirino ring the morning Angelus, but on awakening, I realized I was hearing the bell strokes of the parish church of San Benin. The dream had taken the entire night. Don Bosco concluded his account with these words. The Salesians will draw the people of South America to Jesus Christ by the sweetness of St. Francis de Sales. It will be a most difficult task to teach the savages a moral way of life but their children will easily yield to the words of the missionaries and live in towns with them. Civilization will supplant savagery, and thus many Indians will enter the flock of Jesus Christ. A few days later, almost in confirmation of these extraordinary prophecies, a letter arrived from Bishop Bernard August Thiel of San Jose, Costa Rica, a Vincentian, who wrote to ask Don Bosco for a few Salesian missionaries. San Jose is located precisely on the 10th parallel mentioned in the dream. Don Bosco himself wrote to Count Cole on February 11th, 1884, the journey I made with our dear Louis keeps unraveling itself every day. At this time, it seems to have turned into the very heart of our work. Much is said and written and publicized to explain our plans and make them a reality. Relevant to the dream of Patagonia, Father Lemoyne gathered these words directly from Don Bosco. He said, When people come to know the wealth which makes Patagonia precious, this land will have an extraordinary commercial development. In the bowels of the mountains lie hidden precious minerals. In the Andes, between the 10th and 20th parallels, are to be found deposits of lead, gold, and other minerals more precious than gold. At this point in the biographical memoirs of St. John Bosco, where I found this story, the Salesians wrote that our readers may have some notion of the significance of this dream, we will highlight some outstanding features. Keep in mind this was written in the 19th century. Don Bosco gave us a mass of positive data which he couldn't have learned from either travelers or explorers since no explorations of any kind had been made in those southernmost latitudes either for tourism or for scientific study. To this data are to be added prophetic statements which point to a future more or less remote. Let us consider the description of the Andes given by Don Bosco. It was the common opinion that they formed a dividing wall running north and south for more than 30 degrees of latitude. Instead, 
Explorations and studies over several decades have shown that, as Don Bosco correctly observed, the range is broken up by innumerable depressions in the form of inlets, valleys, and lake basins. This is completely opposite to the old idea of one solid homogeneous mass. In Don Bosco's description, which shows a vertical structure of the Andes and its different modifications, we find an impressive precision. Not even the most authoritative geographer could, at that time, have come out with such a definitive and precise affirmation as did Don Bosco. To be convinced that in those days people had no knowledge of the existence of so many coves and valleys, all one needs to do is look at the maps of those years. Our saint also asserts that extraordinarily rich deposits of coal, petroleum, lead, and even precious metals lie hidden in the bowels of those mountains, placed there for the good of humanity by the all-powerful hand of the Creator. And now, year after year, new mineral deposits are being discovered all through the Andes and along the coast of the Atlantic. Lastly, Don Bosco described fantasy railroads where only deserts and wastelands existed. Today, the rail networks of the republics of Central and South America have undergone a remarkable development and in many places crisscross the Andes. Tracks have been laid along the ridge of the Andes, and the day isn't far off when, in fulfillment of Don Bosco's prophecy, these railroads will cross all of Patagonia and tie the northern shores of South America to the Strait of Magellan. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to hear about St. John Bosco's dream titled The Monster on the Playground, just click on the link above me here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.